Hi, this is Af Malhotra and welcome to Straight Talk with Af. Today I have a wonderful guest with me, the, the brilliant AI master, expert and author, Ken Hubble. Now, before I introduce Ken, I want to be very clear that Ken has uh, not only published an extremely important book, which is called There Is AI in Team, The Future of Human, uh, Augmented Human and Non-Human Collaboration. And AI, AI has been a topic that, as you all know, even watching the last few episodes, has been front of mind for all of us, whether it's generative AI and my conversation with Rohit Talvar a few weeks ago, or Dr. Tomas uh, Chamorro Promuzic, who is at Manpower and an author and a speaker at you know Columbia and UCL, who wrote his book, I Human, uh, most recently, AI Automation and the, the a Quest to Reclaim Our Humanity. Uh, all of these books have something uh, that uh, meet somewhere in the middle, which is about humanity and humanness and being human. And Ken has worked hard to try and get this message across to us, 283 pages of wisdom and value. I met Ken on a you know large language model um, sort of expedition that I've been on with diversity economics for the last year and a half. And he's been instrumental in helping me think through how AI can be built, what it can do, what it can't do, when it can do it, how fast it'll progress, what to be aware of, what to um, prepare for, and so on and so forth. So Ken, it's a privilege to have you on Straight Talk. This is not your first time. You have been no. here on the show a couple of times, so you're a bit of a veteran. Uh, welcome to Straight Talk, this time as an author uh, in your own right. Ah, uh, thanks very much. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. Now, you know, as you know, every straight talk is about the person, first and foremost. And so, before we get into the book, which we're of course desperately to you know keen to understand and and delve into, tell us about Ken. So, what is the story about Ken? Who who is Ken? Where do you live? Where are you from? How did you get into this world of AI? Just a bit of a whistle-stop tour, which will give us more context around your personal journey. All right. So uh, I am uh, in the U.S. Uh, I live in an area called Research Triangle Park, uh, which is a, a fancy name for uh, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, and all the associated universities that are here. So we have NC State and UNC Chapel Hill and Duke University. Uh, yeah. and Shaw University. And I mean, it's like a, a huge conglomerate of universities and community colleges. And so, uh, you know, I've been privileged to live here uh, and grow up here. Um, and, you know, I I got started 1978, 76, something like that. Um, when I got a chance to program my first computer, uh, it was a, a, a TRS-80 Model 1. And, uh, and so I had a, a teacher that uh, had gotten one and got me interested in it, and uh, I've been been with it ever since. Uh, the interesting thing is that when I when I left high school, uh, I went a different route uh, for a bit, uh, mm. and uh, and I was I was in the military academy here in the in the states at West Point. Uh, my first year, I got a chance to do uh, Fortran programming and some heavy duty things on uh, TSOs. Um, and I realized that the military wasn't for me. And, uh, so I, I shifted gears and went into industrial design school at, uh, North Carolina state university, uh, and realized I really liked designing things. Uh, and what was interesting is that at that point in time, computer graphics were really coming into vogue. Right. Uh, and so I was at the right place at the right time and got a chance to, uh, learn, uh, how to do computer animation, and then uh, from a career standpoint, realized that you could automate a lot of the stuff that we were trying to do by hand mm. um, by coding it. And so I got back into doing my computer programming uh, and started doing automation scripts to automate right. the process of doing some really neat uh, industrial animations uh, yeah. and and how-to videos uh, back in the day that they really didn't exist. And um, that that ability to teach things or be able to com com communicate how to do things uh, shifted me into a role of where I was doing more and more training type materials. 
Yeah. And so I got into the uh, the learning and development field. And the more I was in the learning and development field, the more I realized that the bridge between visual communications, animation, video, uh, training and development, simulation, uh, I had the opportunity to do simulators for uh, Caterpillar and, and NASA and Lockheed Martin. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there was this blending of computer programming and graphics and instructional design <clears throat> that just kind of merged. You know, we tried to do some things with VR at the time. Uh, the technology just wasn't quite there yet. We tried to do real-time 3D. Uh, and, and I worked with a company that we actually helped create Shockwave 3D for the internet uh, with Intel and Macromedia at the time and created an authoring tool for it. And that was where I really started getting a feel for modular design and the modular approach to things. And I just kept building and building on this kind of, of thought process. And, and one of the things you start realizing when you, when you look at training in that way, and when you look at the types of things you can do, is that there's a shift occurring in the country, in the world, as far as how we do education and training. And yes. that that was heading towards a realm of talent disruption. So we were seeing more and more automation and robotics coming into the industry. And we had to start training around that. And there was this fear, even back, and this was uh, prior to 2010, uh, we, we saw this fear of if we automate the process of doing this, or if we provide performance support that's electronic to do something else, it would eliminate the need for trainers or mm -hmm. for, uh, you know, organizational, you know, uh, manual processing for a lot of things. Uh, I mean, we saw, we saw this in supermarkets when the mm -hmm. self-checkout lanes started coming into play mm -hmm. and uh, automated gas pumps. And, you know, I mean, these are things that we take for granted now, mm -hmm. uh, ATM machines. We take mm -hmm. these things for granted now. But those were revolutionary and scary things to people because mm. it was taking, it was supposedly taking away jobs. Uh, what we found out is it actually uh, increased the need for other skills. Same mm. thing with desktop publishing back in the day. You know, we thought that was going to, you know, destroy the publishing industry. It's actually mm. amplified the publishing industry beyond belief. Yes. And so, so when you look at this and you start looking at it from a, a broad brush perspective, you start realizing there's a ton of talent disruption going on. So I've been speaking on the topic of talent disruption since uh, the, you know, the mid 2000s. And one of the things I picked up on early with the talent disruption was all this automation that was starting to take place. Then when the Alexa and Siri and uh, Google Home devices came into play in the early 2010s, uh, you know, the, 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 the teen years there. Um, that's when I found that that's when I found my calling back to AI. So I yeah. dabbled a little bit yeah. with AI back in the, the Lisp days, uh, which is a programming language that I was using for AutoCAD. And, and it didn't go very far because the technology, the support, it wasn't really there to go fast enough. Then when uh, these, these uh, personal assistant devices came out and you could start programming language interaction and, and communication, I was like, okay, this is great. Mm -hmm. and, and so my approach was not to do yet another trivia game for yeah. the Alexa, yeah. but instead to do performance support. Yes. And so I figured out how to get it to where I could ask it questions yeah. and it would respond either from a, a, a library of content that I had put out there or uh, general uh, searches uh, on, on the web. And so I created a few skills around that. And uh, somewhere in the mid 2017-ish time period, uh, a guy named Nick Carinas and I met. And, you know, we've had, we've, we've spoken with, you know, you've spoken with Nick and I and, and others. Uh, and we realized, okay, this needs to be something that everyone can use. And we went down the path of doing education first because that was seen to be the low hanging mm. fruit. And then mm. we realized after getting feedback from potential customers, what they really wanted was the tools that we were using to build 
the education products. And right, so yeah. Nick yeah. and myself and 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 some others uh, have a company called Sophos. AI, well, Sophos Inc., and it's at Sophos.ai. And I'm now the chief product officer uh, for that company. And uh, we're built, we built out a platform. Uh, it is available and it's modular and it's yeah. you know developer friendly. Yeah. And as a pro as a byproduct of that, back in 2017, when Nick and I met, I started realizing in conjunction with the technology, we needed to address the human factor. Yes. And that's where the book's inception came. And I'm going to Got read it. one line out of the book here real quick, because this really fits. And it is, we are at a critical time where we can create a world that is smarter, more efficient, and more human. And that coupled with the, uh, I was batting around some ideas at the time. And I said, you know, you know, in the, in the future, it's not going to be about, you know, there is no I in team. It's that there is AI in team. And AI, not only as, as we've been talking about it from a generative AI, chat GPT and things like that, but AI as in non-human or non you know, or, or augmented human, augmented intelligence and, uh, and all the things that go along with it. And that middle piece, so we have humans and we have AI, straight up AI, but it's that middle section that gets left out of the equation. And that is where some fascinating things are happening yes. that really are flying under the radar screen right now. But if you want to talk about transformation, that is where you know the 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 the, the, the boldness of what we're doing is taking is, is really going to amplify what we can do as human beings. Uh, but we have to get past some uh phobias and some 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 fears that we have. And, and that's where this book came into play is how do you explain it? You know, my wife and I were talking one day and, and I've got kids in, 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 uh, that are postgraduate and they're involved in everything from anthropology to, uh, to writing and to, to technology. And they all said, dad, you need to take this idea and you need to help people understand that this is not the end of the world. This is the beginning of something new. Right. And so that's that was that that's that's how we got here. That's how I got right. to this point. And now we have a book. Beautifully summed up. Let's let's go right into it. So you've touched on timing is everything. You know, when in the entrepreneurial world we talk about ideas are abundant, execution is scarce. That's something that you know I coined as a as a quote when I started my startup journey, realizing that oh my god, I had all these brilliant ideas as a corporate. <laughs> then I came to the real world and I thought, oops. <laughs> there are many other ideas, but I, actually it's all about execution and execution has its own trials and tribulations. And so let's go right into the book. And um, if, if possible, we're going to take bits of the book out and bring it to life, especially the, the parts that are closest to you and the ones that are most memorable for you. And I know you've got a lot of testimonials from some, some prolific and iconic people out there in the industry as well. So I want to start with the most basic question, because we're going to use this opportunity to, to pick your brains on uh, all of this knowledge that you have as much as it's about the book, because I guess the book is a byproduct of that. W what do you believe when you talk about, let's go first into the good stuff. So when you talk yeah. about these transformations, when you talk about AI, there is AI in team. Can you just unpack that? Tell us what you mean by that in the in the context of uh, real life and people in a yeah. job, people in an executive position and so on. So uh, I'm, I'm going to spin back. There, there's an episode of Star Trek, the original Star Trek series. Yes, I'm a big, where... I'm a big Trekkie. I love it. Love it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so you might remember that it was called a wolf in the fold. And it's in, in the, in the episode, Scotty, who's the chief engineer uh, is accused of murder. And so they have a trial going on and they're describing. So you have all these officers in this room and they're describing what's going on mm -hmm. uh, and all of the facts and, 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 and things like that, that, that are associated with the case. And at one point they say, computer, take everything you've just heard for the last 20 minutes or so and compare and contrast that with other information that's available about other circumstances that, that may be similar to this. Yes. And 
come up with a potential scenario for what this could be, how this could have happened, and, and did it have to be, Scotty? So the computer's just been listening at this point. And then it comes back and it says, based upon all I've been able to come up with, um, there's a pattern. Now, the human beings in that room would never have been able to put that pattern together because it was knowledge that was available from a very disparate set of information that was out there. Yes. Now, imagine I'm in a boardroom and we've got ideas percolating about the next product or how we're going to work around a specific business situation. And we can say, okay, so based upon similar things and the trends that are currently happening in the marketplace and our target market, what would you suggest? Now, you're going to get interesting ideas from all the people that are in there. And it's going to be from their different perspectives. But the AI in the room, can analyze all this information and then provide additional information or a, a, a yet another perspective um, that might never have been considered otherwise. And it can do it from multiple domains. So if right. you have a company that produces a product and, and you're like, okay, we need to make this sustainable and we need to make this you know, interesting and modern and it needs to tie in with the trends going on today, uh, because the AI actually may reach out to biological and physical and industrial and, uh, and all different types of domains, including things like anthropological. So that's yes. the use of tools. That's, that's humanity's use of tools. Yes. All of a sudden, you have this ability to pull this in, and it may come up with a product that says, hey, if you build it this way with this material, which doesn't yeah. exist yet, but could because biology says it could, yeah, and, uh, and 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 address it in this manner, that could lead it to where that that could be the product that you want. Now, yeah. again, it's one point of information, and as long as we treat it as one point of information, yeah, and not the end all be all, a humanity you know keeps a role in this whole thing, but b it addresses the aspects of humanity that people tend to gloss over, which is human beings are unpredictable. Just because the trend, if every trend that we saw in the marketplace, even the ones that have nothing to do with AI, if all the trends in the marketplace actually work the way they're supposed to, as far as I'm, I've got this trajectory and that's where I'm going, we wouldn't see some of the deviations and some of the, you know, the unique innovative products coming out that we have coming out. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and that includes things like, you know, why did bell bottom jeans come back? I mean, I've, yeah. I've been thinking about this for a long time. I'm like, what crazy yeah. person thought that was a great idea, but they came yeah. back. If you look at that from the standpoint of statistical data, it makes no sense at all, but they came back and people wear them. And then, yeah. you know, it's like, okay, so, so if that's the case, that's unpredictable. AI should have never and probably never would have come up with that as a solution for the fashion industry, but it did. You know, AI didn't, but the, the, the market did. So. And when you think about, it's a great example with Star Trek, okay, and one that many will relate to. And of course, the boardroom, that's a great example too, because there'll be many who would be sitting in meeting rooms, um, maybe just they've come out of a meeting room and they're listening to this podcast or this video cast and they're thinking through what you're saying and let's not forget i want to be really clear the word on the street right now is that the more advanced companies not the tech but the non-tech companies that want to be tech have for the want of another term got these special workforces or task forces you know the the swat team that is dedicated to generative ai or some some of them are actually called uh, chat gpt teams to figure out what yeah. the hell chat GPT or open AI type models are, is going to do to their business model. And it's almost like, it reminds me of, you know, it's almost like the internet revolution or the uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the Google revolution when there was, you know, google.com and you could yeah. search for anything and you didn't need books anymore, or there right. was the cellular revolution. It, it really right. is. And you'll know more, of course, because you've studied it. Walk us, you know, for those who are trying to figure this out, walk us through what has changed in the last year and a half that, you know, why wasn't this topical? Why didn't you launch your book two years ago? Why, you know, why are you talking yeah. about it now? What's happened that must, uh, you know, I know people say it's okay, you know, chat GPT was launched, but tell us the technical, what, what really happened here that maybe we don't know about? 
you had you had a combination of things happening, and 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 you know uh, these companies. By the way, this is this is a perfect example of an overnight success that took decades to get there. Yeah. Okay, you know, and 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 people people talk about it like it's like wow, this thing ChatGPT just came out of nowhere, and it was it was is it's awesome, and it can do some great things. And yeah. and if you look at what's happened, it's actually the culmination of decades of work. Yeah. Okay. And and so uh, you know, depending from the audience that, that that's watching this, a large language model is a collection of massive massive amounts of information, uh, data points, et cetera, that have been trained. And this is not like, like well, my, my son calls this like training a, an infant because he's got a two and a half year old. Um, and he's, but but his point is not totally out of line. So when, an L, when, when someone's using an LLM to make a decision or to ask a question and it comes back with an answer and it says something just ludicrous. Hmm. You respond back to it and say, you know, that's not what I expected. And depending upon the the uh, the fidelity of the way that you can uh, respond to it and say, hey, you got this wrong, but you got most of it right, you know, and 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 can provide feedback, then it learns the next time not to do it that way. Yes. And one thing to understand about these LLMs, and this is this is where there's a lot of there's a lot of confusion, and even some of the programmers don't necessarily understand what's happening on the inside. And 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 I, I'll be the first to tell you, I don't know all of what's going on the inside, but I can tell you what I've observed, and that is that you know large language models are predictive statistical modeling, uh, essentially. So what it's doing is it's saying, okay, based on all of the data I've gathered, all of the the language and the material. As I'm just as you've asked me a question, mo the, the most popular answer to that question, or the most popular phrase to go with that that question, is this phrase or this set of terms, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna put that out, and now I'm gonna also say okay so and the most next logical thing to say after that is this. And then the most next logical thing to say after that is this, and it's piecing this together. Mm -hmm. Now, if you started using ChatGPT early on, one of the things you may have seen it do is it would start writing out something and then it would backtrack and it would write something else and then backtrack again. So you saw this, this zigzagging of text across the screen and they've stopped that. But at a point in the beginning, it was still learning. And so it was doing this thing. And what's happening there is this. It's doing the predictive modeling. And then it's going, wait, I got too far and this doesn't make any sense anymore. So now I need to go back and change what I said so that it flows better. And it, so it's doing this, it's actually, it's actually adjusting itself. Now, the other thing that ChatGPT has is a little thumbs up, thumbs down thing. All right, it's yeah. still learning. It's yeah. still training itself. And so at the end, you have the option. You look at it and go, okay, uh, this answer, eh, it was okay. And you give it a thumbs down or a thumbs up. And, and you might get another one that's like, eh, this mm. really didn't hit the mark at all. Thumbs mm. down. And uh, that's helping it learn. So now the next time somebody asks something similar to what you just asked, it's going to give st you know, a statistical gathering of, of information to, to, to determine what that is. And so, so we are teaching it still in matter of fact it will always be learning from us right yeah with the exception of one thing and this is this is one area where a lot of people are, are starting to, to to get this glimmer in their head and and and, and start going wait a second if chat gpt or, or gpt4 which is you know what, what's out there if what it knows it scraped out of the web and all the existing material that's out there and it's now being used to write material for the web, the next generation is actually going to be cannibalizing itself. Or yes. it's got a, uh, an, a, 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 an inbreeding situation. In either case, if you look at the similarities between it and humanity, humans, if they cannibalize, or humans, if they have inbreeding, eventually over time start getting genetic defects and that's essentially what will happen with chat 
you know, with, with the GPT type things, is that it's going to start getting genetic defects unless there's an insertion of new blood. And guess what? Humans are the new blood. So you can't, it, it will, it will eventually deteriorate unless it has a continuous stream of new human fed information into yeah. the system. And that's, that's the part again, that's the team. AI needs us as much as we need it. Yeah. Yeah. So this is brilliant. So a few more questions. So you've got the LLM. The LLM yeah. is, as you say, it's well put. It's a statistical model of sorts, but very advanced. And it's ingesting loads of different types of artifacts, um, content, material, structured, unstructured, you name it. And is it true to say that you can, you have, this is a basic question, but I must ask it. Yeah. So you have chat gpt which is 20 bucks a month on a premium subscription these days okay yeah and you also have open ai that provides the gpt back end to someone who wants to use it for more adventurous work technical people who want to use it for scaled work is that chat based as well or is that some other interface all right so chat so this is an interesting my my son is an anthropologist Right. Or he's wrapping up his anthropology degree right now. And so he started using uh, chat GPT and he's been using the Sophos chat engine. He's been dabbling with a bunch of different ones, part of yeah. the research he's doing. Yeah. And, and, and he got really fascinated with it because he, he was like, dad, you could use this to, you know, create, you know, quizzes for yourself so you can practice for tests and stuff like that. Cause yeah. you know, and he even used it to generate a full rubric. He was like, okay, you know, determine, you know, determine the, the levels of a beginner, an intermediate, intermediate or an advanced uh, answer to this set of questions. And, and so he was using it to do, you know, to do work for him. And, yeah. and it was, it was pretty fascinating. But one of the things he said was, he says, dad, he says, I don't know what they're doing, but chat GPT's answers are different than these, uh, than, than yours, meaning the Sophos one <clears throat> and somebody else's. <clears throat> And one of the things we realize is this, because of, and I, I, this is just a personal belief. I don't know this. And I, this is not, I, I'm actually reached out to the chat GPT folks and asked them if this is what they're doing, but I believe this is what's happening because of the visibility of chat GPT and because of the legal issues that may arise because of some of the answers it was giving and, and some of the things it was doing on top of the underpinnings that OpenAI has for the GPT uh, language models. ChatGPT has a front end that's sitting on top of it that is filtering both the information going in and coming back out. Now, we already know that, that ChatGPT was, was taking the intellectual property of whatever you were typing in and using it to train the model even more than what it was. Right. Can I just interject for a moment? Yeah. I just want to put a massive disclaimer out there yeah. because I know of some um, some situations just to make it clear and you can endorse it. Yeah. For everyone listening right now, when you put stuff into chat GPT, if it is your IP, it's like your next big business model or your idea or a very private letter you're writing to someone. And if you're throwing it into chat GPT inadvertently, you're letting the entire planet know that it exists. And ChatGPT was saying, thank you very much. I'll get better now and stronger with that insight. But now you've given away that could be something that could be your trade secret. Is that fair to say, Ken? I just want to make sure, because I've heard some awful stories of senior yeah. executives <laughs> and companies using GPT to write code or to debug and saying, hey, we got the debug uh, a format here, great. We just replay that again. We just upload code, debug, upload code. Way cheaper than going to like a consultancy, and oh, yeah. you know, and we were like, <clears throat> "Oh my god, are you serious?" So I just want you to ratify well, that point. Yeah, and 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 you know, so Samsung ran into this. Uh, some guys on the in the in, or gals on on the Samsung uh, programming team uh, were using uh, ChatGPT to validate some code, and inadvertently there were also tokens or, or keys to certain other applications that they had in their code. And so they inadvertently put those keys out there. And I don't know the exact circumstances, but from what I've read, um, those keys actually made, it, made their way back into some other people's answers. 
<clears throat> so, you know, so there's, 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 there's that risk. The other mm-hmm. thing is this. I don't know if you've noticed this, but in a lot of corporations, they put a little disclaimer at the bottom of an email. This is copyrighted material, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, the U.S. Copyright Office right now has said that if it is totally generated by, by, by ChatGPT or AI, it's not copyright protected. So if you have people that are generating emails from within your organization and you think that those emails are protected by copyright, if, they're, if, they're, if, if they can't prove that a significant amount of that email actually wasn't AI generated, it's no longer copyrighted. Right. And so, so there's, 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 there's some aspect. And I talked about this in the, I, I have a chapter called the AI elephant in the room. And, and, and it, and it really is the elephant. The elephant right now is, okay, so how do we define the ethics and, 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 and protect ourselves as human beings with this? Yes. yes. But it's also about how do we protect the AI and the robots from this? You know, it's, it's, and, and, and people go, well, they're just machines or they're tools and stuff like that. But and they're right, they are machines and tools. But over time, as we tend to anthropomorphize things anyway, uh, which is, which is uh, a big word that means, you know, give human characteristics or human attributes uh, to, uh, to things that are machines. Um, you know, at a certain point, depending upon how we have cultivated these, those those feelings <laughs> or those those characteristics that we're giving to the to the machines um, may come back to bite us in the end if we're not careful on how we treat uh, these 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 things that we're now you know giving feel to and it's 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 an interesting dynamic that's happening right now yeah because uh, when you when you think about the rights to materials there's this huge copyright issue thing now of well, yeah. uh, Mid Journey and and Dolly and and, and some of these other ones uh, that, that do the visual materials, um, where did they get their source material? Now, I would tell you as a <clears throat> as a as a designer, as an industrial designer who spent hours at the museum copying paintings off the wall and sketching them and things like that, I will tell you that everything is fair game in uh, in the art world. As, as long as you either give credit or um, you're careful to differentiate your end product significantly from the original and you're just using the original as, as, an, as an inspiration. Right. But most, most paint, well, I shouldn't say most, some or a lot of painters, artists, et cetera, emulate other artists when they're first starting out so they right. can figure out their style their 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 uh, you know right. their particular niche right. uh, same thing with writers i mean there's writers poets i mean uh you know screenplay writers uh which by the way they're on strike right now uh for this very reason is they're worried about their livelihood but you know th- th- i think they're missing the bigger picture which is we have always adapted other other sources and even if it's nature to do this photography when it first started was considered you know they they wouldn't a lot you know that was that was a bad thing you know you're not really an artist because you're a photographer and that's not the case you are you're, right. you're taking your perspective your point of view there was a lot of chemistry and 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 um, uh, technical work that was done in early photography to achieve the outputs that they were doing and 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 create that uniqueness. Yes. And we have the same opportunity now with generative AI. Yeah. And it's it's about asking the right questions. And I've I've been a big proponent for this for a long time, even in the learning space, which is we have got to educate people how to ask the right questions. How do we get the results that we want from the tools that we have or that we want to build? to allow us to continue to innovate as a species. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you hit the nail on the head and we'll come to the the, the film world in a second because it's topical and it's important. Let's go back to the book for a moment and you talked about, and going back to the title, there's AI in team, okay? There's AI in team. So what, what do you mean by that? I mean, you know, if I, I'm a team, okay? I'm a team in a corporate organization somewhere or a startup. 
what do you what do you what is your definition of there's AI in team? Just give us some use cases. Okay. So, you know, teams and, and, and we've been going through a lot of transformation on what makes up a team. Yes. You know, it has nothing to do with technology. It has all yeah. to do with, with diversity and equity and inclusion. Uh, you know, are we, you know, are we drawing from the, the vast array of resources that are available in any given company uh, mm-hmm. or in the, you know, the, the up and coming uh potential employees are we are we really looking at them from a diverse standpoint yeah. and one of the things uh, and I'm going to diverge to the to the augmented human and not the AI for just a second so augmented humans when we think about you know and en- human enhancement in general um, there we, we are we are at the same point or close to it with human augmentation as we are with generative AI it's just not been given the big stage that generative AI has. Yeah. But for those of you who are not familiar with it, there are a couple of companies. One's called Autobot and one is called uh, Open Bionics. And both of them produce products that enhance human capability um, in a way that, that we really haven't seen before. So Open Bionics, if, if, if you have... Uh, if, if you're unfortunate enough to be born without a limb, uh, or have an injury that, that results in losing a limb, their, their major focus is on arms and hands at this point. Right. Right. Um, So they're a robotics business, a robotics, they're a robotics business, but they're a prosthetics business Yeah, yeah. in particular. So they have said, okay, um, you know, if there's a kid that's lost a lost limb or was born without a limb, you know, an arm. Uh, will outfit you with a custom arm. Now, if these were just flesh-colored regular arms, it would be uh, it would be important, but it wouldn't be as fascinating as what's happening. They said, "Why stop at creating just a regular arm? We're going to give you an arm that looks like Iron Man." Now, if you're nine years old and you get an arm that makes you look like Iron Man, that's pretty freaking cool, especially. Because now you can actually do things that you couldn't do before. Now, they've been very careful. They've limited it to where these arms are limit, are, are, are no stronger than a normal human being's arm would be. That's because they have taken the steps to do that. Those arms could be fireproof. Yeah. They could be 10 times more powerful than a regular arm. Now you now you're stepping into a zone that's like okay so as this child grows up or if if, if you're you know uh, an adult and you have a missing arm and you get one replaced now if yours is stronger now than anybody else's in your company what does that mean mm. uh, if you have um, I mean we've been doing this internally for a long time so you got artificial hips artificial knees mm. artificial this that and the other thing my my dad was going to have to have reconstruct a surgery on his shoulder and they were going to invert the way the bones work I, I have no idea how it actually would do what it does but it would have made him stronger and more flexible than he was yes. before he had the surgery and so the the questions that come to my mind are at this point is okay as we head into this century where you can modify the human body or re- you know replace things that are missing with things that are not just as strong or as normal as a human being but now more capable or at least enhanced uh, beyond the ability of a normal human being yes. now all of a sudden we're in the the realm of the six million dollar man when i was a kid in the 1970s yes. yes and and so now you have someone that can be you know, imagine I, I I lose my eye. My eyes suck anyway right now. I've got trifocals. And so I, I would love to replace one of my eyes with one that actually worked. But imagine if I could actually have one that doubled as a long range telescope and a microscope at the same time. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and that's, we're not too far away from that. Yes. That's, that's fascinating. Now, imagine you're augmenting a person where now when I walk into a room 
I've got a pair of, um, let's not go so far as replacing my eye. Let's, let's do the, the lens. So I've got my glasses, but now my glasses <clears throat> are augmented reality. Yes. <clears throat> and I've got an earpiece in and I'm walking into a room and I'm a salesperson, let's say, and I'm at a dinner party. There's a lot of people there and I'm scanning the room and the AI is picking up on who all the people are in the room. Now, I may not have the world's greatest memory for names, but I, rem I remember faces. Yeah. Now, imagine if you didn't have to remember the names. Imagine if I'm scanning across the room and it's telling me that's Bob, that's Mary, that's Sue. And if I lock in on any of them, it says, that's Bob. You met him three weeks ago or three years ago. He's got a dog, three kids. He lives in the Hamptons. He's whatever. You know, all mm. the specs are coming up here. Oh, and by the way, he talked to you about this idea that he had mm -hmm. and he wasn't ready to purchase from you then. But based upon his portfolio right now, he's probably ready to move on that. Yeah. And that's all being told to me and relayed to me as I'm walking over to him. And it's already figured out how far away I was when I started walking. So it's giving me a condensed version of all that that would fit in the time frame it takes me to actually walk from point A to point B. That's where we're headed. That's human augmentation in a way that a lot of people yeah. may or may not be thinking about. And and do you, <clears throat> do you think, I mean, that's, you know, one absolutely, I would say, extravagant example for some because they were like, well, wow, it's like a sci-fi movie. There are also real examples that are examples that are that are just so close to us right now, like we can touch and feel when it comes to team. Any 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 insight into into that, which is like, a, yeah. like imagine two months down the line, a year down the line, you will be doing this in our team environment. So when you're trying to put together a team, I mean, there's there's you 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 go, okay, here's the project. Yeah. And I need to have a, a person does this, 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 and this. Now imagine yeah. if instead of having to, to figure out who amongst the company I could use to diversify my team and be inclusive and also have all the expertise that I need. Right. And that's <clears throat> that that may be off of the internal company's website, you know, uh, list of skills, or it may tap into some other skills that the person has but just hasn't been able to use yet. And you know, for, for the company. <clears throat> now imagine if. AI can help you make that selection. You know, if you've got a very small company, you know, a couple hundred people, it might be very easy to make that selection. Hmm. But if you have a company that's got 200,000 people in it yeah. and you want the best team for that, wouldn't it be great to have AI be able to go out, do the career profiles of everyone, figure out who's who, who A is not currently working on a project that would interfere with the one that you've got in mind. Yeah. B, people that are looking for the opportunity to, to do that type of project. Yeah. Uh, C, that you've got the inclusive perspectives of a wide range of demographics that, that would help benefit the product, um, you know, and, and, and pulls all those together and says, not only that, but we're going to put AI on the team because, gee, wouldn't it be great if we could have something that we could bounce ideas off of and rapidly have it generate prototypes. I mean, there, there's there's coding AI now that literally will create an app for you. You know yeah. that you know in seconds. Yeah. <laughs> That's the part yeah. that's just baffling. Yeah. You know, to a lot of people is that you know we're not talking about something that you add to the team and it adds a, a, a tiny percentage of amount of impact. We're talking about something that takes processes that, that would take weeks. Yeah. And, and condenses it to minutes. Now, yeah. now because you can do that, that's not to replace the people in the room. That's because now they can ideate faster. Yeah, yeah. And and so so by having AI on the team, you're able to do things that you might not be otherwise able to do. Mm. And and we, we we tend to talk about AI right now as as the generative side of things, but it's also able to suck in data like nobody's business if it's hooked up to the right data sources. Yes. Well, we have IoT in a lot of devices now. Right. And yeah. so if in and, and you don't even have to physically be there. So now you can send out a AI team of, 
of, of feelers out to the IoT devices, pull the data in, look at the metrics, not just for today, but the metrics for like the last six years yeah. and project what the metrics will be for the next six years. Yeah. And yeah. now you can pull that data in. Now that's useful information. That's like having an entire research team. Yeah, yeah. That's now part of your team. And for small companies, this is this is the thing. It, it, it's beneficial for large companies, yeah. but for a small company that doesn't have the resources to hire, you know, twenty researchers, maybe they want to hire one. That mm. one then, you know, basically prompts and and feeds the rest of the team, much yeah. as the way as a senior manager would do for a research team. Yeah, we're not talking about even dumbing down what that person's doing. It's still very important. Uh, it's, I would say critical that they are asking the right questions, but now they don't have to have an army of people to do this that they couldn't have afforded anyway. Yeah, And that's the key. It's not that we're replacing people. It's we couldn't afford them anyway. So yes. now we're finding an alternative to that. Yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point. And, and it's a very important, very important point that you've just made. And I think it, a lot of this is about reframing. You know, uh, because of course, of course, the catastrophic perceptions or the perceptions that lead to someone feeling like this is a catastrophic event. And it's, you know, um, it's a significant event in the sense that it has perils and it has downsides for me and my life's going to be upended and so on. You know, I think we I'm seeing over the course of the last six months. You know, the the narrative is changing from people in AI like us, and we're we're trying to recalibrate our messaging, not to come up with marketing fluff or sales spin, actually realizations. We're also learning as this AI is yeah. developing at such a rapid, alarming pace. Every single day it's it's developing and new products are coming out, new LLMs are coming out. God, and they're like thousands, uh, like you were telling me, a thousand plus LLMs now. And a great analogy, I think you and Nick give me, Nick Carinos at Sophos, I love it, is that an LLM is like a the old school website where, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, there were like a handful of them, and now they're billions. And so they're going to be billions of LLMs out there, right? And each LLM has its own, it, it's an expert in its own right for whatever yeah. issue. And you're literally putting your tentacles in and sucking out all of this deep expertise to build, yet again, one that is right for you. And, and of course, it's all self-learning. It's intelligent. It's picking up the boardroom conversations, doing counter arguments, saying these, these are the pros, saying these are the cons, saying, well, actually, the probability of that happening is low because of everything that I know. I'm feeding into data from here, data from A, B, C, and D. I mean, that is, isn't that what we see in the science fiction movies anyway? I mean, I just, I was having a bit of a chuckle when you were talking <laughs> about Star Trek, because when you said, oh, Af, remember that environment when... And they were doing the murder trial, and then the and then someone said, "AI, you know, computer. That's what they call it, computer. What is yeah. your and the, the whole uh, you know piece? That's actually a prompt. That's a prompt. Yeah. And yep. so, in fact, I would I would love to see how many prompts were sent out to the computer in Star Trek through all the episodes, because I swear all those prompts were so so advanced, yes. um, and we could actually learn from those prompts. And so I I. I, I want to take you down the direction of, um, so we talked LLMs, we've talked about some innovations, you know, we've talked about open bionics um, as a brilliant, brilliant innovation. And also some ethics being played out there, you know, in terms of, oh, they could make the arm super strong, but they're balancing that. So that's, that's great. People have still got that. Tell us a little bit more about, uh, you know, business models. And cause we've got loads of entrepreneurs who listen to this stuff. Okay. Day in, day out. So it's a straight talk. And so if, if, if one is an entrepreneur in today's mm -hmm. generative AI world and you're trying to build a technology centric business compared to even 2016, 17, you know, just a few years yeah. ago, um, how easy or difficult or cheap or fast or um, efficient is it now for you to build a company? Cause my, my, this is what I want to throw out. I believe the generative AI is going to create a massive shift and a boost in 21st century entrepreneurs. I, as in, we're going to yeah. see many, 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 many more entrepreneurs. I'm not saying they're all going to be unicorns and decacorns, but I think many more home-based, hybrid working, 
one man, two man band entrepreneurs who can quickly, cheaply build businesses and start making money. And at a at worst case, that becomes residual income, like passive yeah. income. That means that they can actually survive and 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 have a decent life, almost like a universal basic income, but through business, almost an alternative. Yeah. What's your view on the transformation that's happened in entrepreneurship with generative AI? We'll come back to the universal basic income thing okay. in a minute. <laughs> yeah, but um, but as far as the the entrepreneurs, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna date myself a little bit. So when I first started doing video production, um, you had to have uh, massive amounts of equipment. Yes, you had shoulder cameras. You had uh, tape decks, you had uh, editing systems, you had, uh, God, it was just, it was just ridiculous. You had things written down on, on paper, <laughs> yeah. as far as your shot list and things like that. Um, uh, you had, you had uh, a limit, you, you actually had to travel around to figure out where you were going to shoot something, because uh, location scouting and things like that, uh, you didn't have an inventory of pictures to go to to figure out where the best location is to take a shot. Mm. And and you also didn't have something that could generate the backgrounds for you if you didn't want to have to go there. Um, and, and so there was weather conditions and things like that to come into play. Um, at one point, I figured out in order for me to get started, because I was also doing computer animation, it was going to cost me roughly two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars back then. This was 20 some odd years ago uh, to get started. OK. I can start a video production company for under five grand right now. And the most expensive piece is if I want to get a really nice camera and a really nice set of lights uh, and, 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 and audio equipment. And, but even that's now down to under five grand. Okay. That is a huge scale difference. That's why you've got all these kids and, and, and people producing YouTube videos and, and, yeah. and, and TikTok and things like that, because they can. And oh, by the way, the distribution format's no longer on tape, which was an expense that was, uh, it was just a ridiculous expense yeah. involved yeah. in it. Now yeah. there's, there's basically no distribution cost, okay? We've leveled the playing field and now you get to put stuff out there and the best content is what wins, or at least yes. you hope it's the best, okay? Yes. And, and we're gonna see the same thing coming out of ChatGPT. Chat GPT or Sophos Chat or whatever is going to be creating the best content in combination with the human person driving it, the creativity driving it. Yes. And 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 so when you look at that, you go, okay, so now we're leveling the playing field for all sorts of domains, uh, whether it's uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing or you know pharmaceutical creation or yeah. Uh, whether it's, uh, you know, how, how do I lay out my warehouse? You know, we're talking about trades and, 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 and fields that were really kind of out on the, the fringe yes. of not using that kind of technology. And now you've got farmers that have machines that can go up and down the beds of, of vegetables and use laser beams to shoot and destroy the weeds. Yeah. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah. Okay. Now, how do you get there? How, how can I, as, a, as an independent, do that? Well, and I'm going to self-promote here for the company I work for. We, uh, at, at Sophos, we have a modular platform that allows you to be able to do uh, natural language processing and these kinds of things that we're talking about here, summarization and email writing and, and um, you know, sentiment analysis and the ability to, to detect in an email what the issue is that somebody's emailing you about and potentially even recommend a solution yeah. uh, based upon things. Okay. And this is a modular platform. So you just use their APIs that you have uh, application programming interfaces that you use, just like when you create a web page and you're making a form call to send yeah. somebody's contact information. The difference yeah. is, is that this allows you to access AI uh, to, to, you know, do what it does best, yeah, and then you combine it with what your your front end interface, your 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 application wants to accomplish, yeah, and yeah. that becomes a reasonable task now. 
because you don't have to be a machine learning expert to do this. You don't have to be an AI expert to do this. You just have to know, this is what I want to do. Here are the Lego blocks I can connect together to do it. And I get my output as I want it. It's a report. Yeah. It's an email. It's a, you know, a story. Uh, yeah. It's a micro lesson, whatever the case might be. Yeah. Yeah. We can do that. And, and it's, and it's cost effective because yeah. you're paying by the SIP. Yeah. And, and that's the benefit. Sorry. What do you mean by SIP? What SIP? So, so, you know, the way that uh, the, the natural language processing stuff works right now is for every character, I mean, the physical letter that you're sending in, there's a there's a hit for it. You know, we're talking about thousandth of a cent, mm -hmm. uh, kind of kind of things. Mm -hmm. And so you have to you have to put in a whole lot of text to actually see it, you know, amounting to anything. Mm -hmm. But for companies that that's their bread and butter, that's what they're generating. If you're generating emails, then it's going to generate a significant amount of text over time. Now, we're still not talking about, I mean, we're talking about thousands of a cents per letter. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in some cases, there's, there's, a, there's a fee for the call, the actual mm -hmm. uh, execution of the task. Um, and there are some restrictions on document size and things like that that are slowly but surely being, you know. Lifted. Lifted because the technology just keeps getting better and better and better. Yeah. And it's yeah. becoming more and more optimized, which is awesome. Yeah. And, yeah, you know our our platform. You can upload documents that have a hundred thousand characters, and wow, you know, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, well, I know, I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know. <laughs> so, so, so the you know, and the power of that is that you can now start doing you know some amazing things with large document repositories, and and it's just going to get better and better and better. So rather than pay a, a, a flat subscription fee. You know, when you don't know whether you're going to use 37 cents worth of text yeah. this week or yes. or if you're going to go beyond that. Um, yes. You know, if you do it by the SIP, it makes it much more economical for you and your yeah. customers. Yeah. And can can you help us? So an entrepreneur says, right, whatever the business idea may be, I need to gather some information. I want to pull information from different data sources. You suffer us, for example, as the platform yeah. that gives me efficiency. So someone comes onto Sophos. You know, you've got all of these different products, uh, LLMs on the back end, all of these tools on the back end, and you're building the, you're creating the building blocks of whatever business model you want to create. Okay. I mean, it's like, right. sounds disruptive in itself. So at that point, how do you know what's new? How do you know? Uh, I hear there's so many LLMs, like you said, how do you know which one to go after? How do you know what to put <laughs> in the building block if you're not technical? So at least what we're, our, our approach is this. You don't have yeah. to. We handle okay. that for you. And okay. you're just asking the questions and you're asking the prompts. You're, 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 you're yeah. you know, putting your requests in. Yeah. And through our filtering on the front side, we, we diagnose what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. And we send it out to the right LLM. Or, yeah. or, or even LM. So, so there's large language models and there's language models. Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more language models coming up, which are finite, constrained, uh, domain yeah. specific um, yeah. that, that are not trying to boil the ocean because you can use the larger ones for the general semantic aspect of the language yeah. and, 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 and the writing and how to do effective writing. But the content can be drawn from another source. Yeah, we do a we do something we call a hybrid approach, which okay. is where you get a chance to use both your own documents and the general purpose, and the we keep your documents private, but we use it as the information source, and we use the other for the writing source. Yeah, and, and so so again, we're 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 you know getting the benefit of both worlds, and that's that's a powerful combination. And I think we're going to see more and more of that, even with the visual stuff that's coming out. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go to the visual stuff. So these, um, it's topical, the the film yeah. actors and the entire fraternity, they're all sort of on strike. So you were saying something that there should be a realization around. So what, what are you saying? I mean, I guess they're worried about deep fakes or, you know, Tom Hanks recently was interviewed and he said, yeah, great. I mean, you know, if, when I, I, I've only got finite capacity now. I can only do another... X number of movies, I might be dead and gone or too old to do any movies any further. Why wouldn't I want my AI version 
to do more movies with the same characteristics, the same sort of style, the same language. Uh, that's my legacy. It carries on. Why would it stop when I'm dead and gone? Yeah. Thoughts? And it's, this actually brings out a, a much bigger topic too, but I'll, I'll talk okay. specifically about that first. Yeah. So um, there are, there are some musicians out there that have already figured out how to capitalize on this. And there's uh, actors that are figuring this out. I mean, uh, you know, Samuel L. Jackson's voice is on the Alexa and things like that. And he was like the pioneer before chat GPT to do that. So, so the beautiful thing is this, is that as long as you can negotiate the licensing of yourself yes. uh, on the front side, then you win or your, your legacy wins. And by the way, this is not new. Everyone's acting like this is new. Back in the 20s, 1920s, you know, when when the talkies and 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 even before that, you know, actors faced a situation where uh, at, the acting profession was not a high uh, high income profession back then. You basically signed on with a with a, with a with a studio, and right. you were expected to produce a certain number of movies per year. At you know, at, at at and at a certain quality level and a certain capability level. I mean, you look at the the, the Disney kids uh, when when they were going up through. A lot of them had contracts that basically said, "Listen, if you're part of the Disney, you are owned by Disney, basically." Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is this concept of of ownership and and licensing mm -hmm. and things like that. This is not new. It is evolving because now we're talking about how you know being you know, a virtual character. Now, there are actors that hit a certain point in their career where they may not be prime candidates for uh, a, a given, you know, movie franchise uh, or given movie type, but their voices are recognizable. Yes. So they go into animation. Now, that's not really them on the screen. Yes. It's a likeness. And sometimes they use photographs and things like that to give the characteristics because mm. of the mannerisms and things like that. Mm. But their voice is what carries that character through. Okay. So is that okay? Because the characters that they're, they're actually on the screen aren't really them. That's right. But their voice is now we're talking about, okay, now I can do both. I can have the character. And if I've scanned the person in and I've created a, a digital avatar version of that person, as realistic as it can be, then now if, uh, you know, I'm going to use Michael J. Fox, for example, Michael J. Fox has a condition and it is debilitating for his ability to do a lot of the character acting that he used to do. And he's still a great actor. So he's done animation and voiced the characters for that. But imagine if we could, if he could all of a sudden have his physical avatar, he's still providing the voice characteristics and 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 the qualities associated with that. Um, but he's now able to participate in movies that he couldn't physically participate in today. Oh, sure. Okay. Sure. So now I have yeah. now I have enabled him. Yes. Okay. And yes. that's that's a that's an important thing. Yeah. Now. Does it, does this whole thing have an element of risk as far as ownership and 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 the licensing of my likeness? Yes, but you have to be careful when you license anything. You know, when you when you go to work for a company, a lot of times, you know, when as a programmer, you go into a company. The first thing the company says is anything you develop while you're working during the day or at night is owned by us because you work yeah. for us. Yeah. Now. In a in a in, in an age of side hustles in the gig economy, that seems really foreign. Yeah. And but it's still in existence for a lot of companies. And yeah. it's and it was definitely in existence back in my early career. Yeah. And so so you know, this bit about who owns what and what's work for hire, and you know, how come I don't get the rights to this, that, and the other thing, that's yeah. all about how you negotiate your contract. Yeah. And and, yeah. and make it happen. And if you are if you are the top commodity, if you are, we've got to have this. Uh, you have exemplified your skills, your capabilities in such a way that you are you are something that is that is a viable product, and you are a product. Yeah. Then you can negotiate. 
if you're just like everybody else, that may not be the case anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, yeah. It, and, 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 you know, people, you know, people will say, well, that's not fair and things like that. And yeah, agreed. You know, from yeah. a certain level, it's not fair, but I have yet to see a business that's fair yeah. ever. Yeah. There's no such thing as fairness in business. It's all a matter of how well you can negotiate to make that happen. And, and, and so that's, it, it, it's hard. I mean, if, if life was fair, you know, my book, when it hits the stands in a couple, you know, in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll sell a million copies right out the bat. Well, let's, let's try and do that. Let's try and do that's that. It, that's it. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> so, so let's get to the book. So, you know, I could talk to you for hours, of course, and I have the privilege of having unfettered access to you. So, um, you know, I, I, I get to do that very regularly. The audience doesn't, and I do want the audience to go buy the book. So this is a time to do a plug, right? So right. tell us about the book. When is it going to be released? Where will it be available? Have you got a website? Um, all of those things, please. All right. So uh, the book is uh, is is currently going into publishing. Uh, it will officially hit the stands, uh, give and take on on Amazon's ability to, to flip this thing around uh, by uh, the twenty first of July. The okay. ebook is already available. I did kind of a soft launch on that back on July first, so that I could get the copyright information obtained. There's certain protocols you have to do there. Uh, which I learned, uh, and uh, so so you had to go through some steps, but um, but yeah, so it's going to be out uh, before August, and uh, it's an exciting it, it's an exciting topic. Uh, I will tell you, mm-hmm. I've been working on it since 2017, uh, before all this stuff happened, right. Right. and uh, and f- you know for one reason or another, um, I, I I found myself in a changing role uh, in November, and my wife said, "Get the book done." And so, and so I did. And, uh, and, and it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's an exciting piece because it happened to be very timely. Yes. Um, yes. Known That's that the cool. stars were, yeah. Who'd have known yeah. that the stars were going to align like they did. Yeah. And, and I specifically chose not to go down the highly technical, let's look at the programming and the guts of things. Mm. This is a book about how this impacts you as an individual uh, us as a society, it affects our business relationships. It affects our personal relationships. It affects our uh, educational system and education, you know, uh, aspects of things. It it is redefining how we look at ethics in business, not just because of the machines. And this is one of the interesting sidebars about this whole thing is that I've been able to use this book in a way to point the lens back at ourselves and say, okay, as we're making these changes, as we're adapting what we call team in a, in a company, as we look at what it takes to work as a team, as a society, what does that mean? What is that? You know, because it's not just the machines, the mm. machines will do what we ask them to do. Mm. They have no emotional involvement. There's, there's no, nothing that is, is in their head, you know, in, in, in the machine's head, if you want to call it that, that says, Ooh, this morning, I want to go out and, uh, you know, conquer the world. That's, that's Mm. not in its, in its, you know, Mm. it's not in its training, unless somebody has done that, Mm. unless someone has programmed to do that. And then that person also has to, has to connect it to the things that can actually make that happen. Mm. I mean, otherwise you get generative AI that's, you know, creating pictures of, of world destruction, but mm. it's not connected to anything to actually make it come to reality. Mm. You know, the, the, the vision doesn't come true unless somebody has deliberately connected the dots. Mm. And those are the people, even if AI didn't exist, we need to worry about. Yeah. People that can connect those kinds of dots and they're thinking those kinds of thoughts. Yeah. We need to be addressing that anyway. Yeah. yeah. AI aside. And yeah. so, so this book points to things like that. It points to things like deep fakes. It points to things like, you know, I, I spoke of the AI elephant in the room, and that's the ethics side of this. And I've got a good friend, Phaedra Benaderis, who um, wrote a book on just that topic. And it's called AI for the Rest of Us. And it's about the ethics involved in this whole game that we're playing here. And, and, and that's, that's the part. 
I want this book to be something that you can discuss over the dinner table with your right. kids, with right. your family, with your friends. This is one I'm hoping will spark conversations because here's the thing. Human teams, human collaboration started around the fire and started around the fire pit, you know, thousands, thousands of years ago, as people discussed things, as people talked about things. So, and if we're going to survive as human beings, and this is heavy on us, we've got to start talking to each other again. We've got to collaborate with each other again. Mm-hmm. We've got to, to, to put aside this aspect of isolationism mm. and come together as a team yes because somebody yes. will be a part of that team yes and if you're worried about your role your position your your status in life you have got to get used to working as a team and and ai and and robotics can be a part of that team and they can help enhance what we're doing they can take the mundane dangerous tasks off of our plates. Mm. Mm. They For, sure. Can, they, For sure. Yeah. They can look at things from a sustainability standpoint that we might not consider because yes. they are not uh, emotionally attached to the outcome. They're just creating an answer or a possible answer. Yeah. We can choose to do with it what we want. That's our teamwork side of things. But they're going to provide a perspective that doesn't get all wrapped around the axle of, you know, well, I, I just, I just don't feel that mm. this is a good thing. You know, mm. they, they're going to be saying, it's going to be saying, look, from a business standpoint, from a world standpoint, from a, a, a civilization standpoint, these are the things that need to happen. Again, yeah. we can choose to do with it what we want. Yes. We've done that all along. And this book, I'm hoping, you know, one of the great things about this book is I took the time to put key takeaways and action items throughout yes. the book. Yes. And these are actionable things that you can do today. It's not yeah. stuff that you got to do tomorrow. It's stuff that you can do today to yes. prepare yourself, your company, your, your organizations to address, prepare, and succeed with AI and robotics. Mm. And that's, that's to me, if, 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 if people can pick this up and walk away with some key things that they can do right mm. now, that's the win mm. because we have got to, we've got to achieve this. This is, this is the, this mm. is the big one. Mm. And, and we're just at the infancy. You know, I, yeah. I outlined yeah. some that's things. That's exciting. And, and, that's the exciting part. That's the exciting yeah. part. I mean, for, I, I would say to just close off, I think for, firstly, thank you for that. And what's the website again? What's your website? Oh, website is, uh, all right, so there's two websites. There's the blog that's mentioned in here, and that is there dot is, no, no, there dash is dash AI dash in dash team dot blogspot dot com. Okay. <clears throat> all right. We've, got, we've definitely got to paste that in the description. Paste that one in. And... <laughs> And then the other is, is just my name. So it's, and don't ask me how I managed to pull this off because I tried this several years ago and my name wasn't available, but it is now. So it's www.kennethhubble.com. Kennethhubble.com. So we'll take that and we'll stick that into the YouTube description. So everyone's got it when they're going through the, the episode. And here's what we're going to do. We'll summarize the video episode as well into a document. Yeah. That's a new thing Straight Talk with AF is doing, where we're taking all of our episodes, 115 of them, and each one we're applying AI and we're summarizing the video of each episode into a digestible, you know, 150, 300 word format, and even providing a counter argument to the discussion. And so that's available totally free. Uh, we're, we're working on that now. And it's just amazing what one can do to appeal to so many people. Different people have different learning styles and, and engagement styles. And so you don't marginalize anyone just because someone likes video uh, versus, you know, written word doesn't mean they don't get to see video. If someone likes written word gets to see written word because that's what they, uh, you know, that's we what like it's about. Word. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So oh, listen, Ken. I will, I will say this. I will say this. So um, at the end of the book, there is a surprise. But I'm okay. not going to tell you what it is, but you got to read uh, okay. it. Okay. 
Okay, we will. And I'm I'm halfway through it anyway, so I will finish it off and then I'll tell everyone there was a surprise, so better read it because I'm not going <laughs> to give it away. And Ken, look, what a pleasure it is to have you on the show. Congratulations on your book. Wonderful. Desperately needed. And we'd love you to come back down the line to figure out what else you think you need to be writing about, because I always find with authors, many of them that I've spoken to, they write a book and then three, four, six, five, 12, whatever months go by, a year goes by and they feel like, ah, I should have added this bit to it. Ah, I should have added this bit. And heck, you know, here's a thought. Why do books have to be static? Like once in you know, snapshot of one, one uh, moment in time, why can't they be interactive and constantly updated like the author comes in like you say you know six months ago i released the book for another 3.99 or whatever it may be here's my add-on to all of the people who bought the book i mean why do we have to have the pdf then then we've got to buy another book and you know i don't know i'm just that's, thinking that's the just... freebie so the blog the blog is designed to do that because i realized i would never publish this thing if i waited until all the information was was yeah. catalog so yeah. go to the blog and yeah. uh, the link is in the book uh, as well. And, uh, and you'll be able to uh, see a continuous stream of oh, curated content. Lovely. Lovely. I love it. So. Great. Ken, before you go, how did the whole experience, um, you know, pan out for you today? You've been on the show so many times, any feedback for yeah. us? Um, how was it for you? No, it was great. At, at, at first I was like, oh, I hope he sends me a list of questions he's going to ask. And then, um, and I, I like this much better. I, I, I like the, uh, I like the way that it just kind of flowed. Um, you know, I, I probably meandered in some spots that, uh, you know, a little longer than I, I anticipated doing, but, uh, but it seemed to flow really well. And yeah. uh, thank you. Yeah. You're, you're a great, you're a great host because you, you, you listen intently and you give the right, pro give the right prompts. There you go. I feel like uh, chat GPT right now, uh, but you give the right prompts to, to keep the dialogue going and flowing in different directions. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. It's my pleasure. What a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, buy the book, know exactly what AI is going to do for your team by reading every page. The 283, don't like skimp on it. And um, Ken, we'll get you back on the show. Thank you for your time. You know, may the force of AI and Gen AI and ethics and yeah, the force no. of AI in team be yeah. with you. And we will see you back on the show. And I look forward to continuing my dialogue with you. Be well, stay happy, and uh, tell us when you sell a million copies. I will do that. Thanks, Alfred. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.